to another edition of Fortinet Live. I'm Jim Richberg, and I have with me today Derek Mankey from Fortinet's FortiGuard Labs. Derek, ransomware continues to be a, a top of mind topic for CISOs I talk with in the public sector around the world, and as well as with CISOs in the private sector, people who focus on operational technology. From your perspective, what can you tell me that's the latest that we're seeing at FortiGuard Labs? Yeah, Jim. So um, here we go again, right? It's it's uh, ransomware. It's it's truly everywhere, uh, unfortunately, and, and, and ubiquitous. Um, and what we're seeing, if you look at our threat landscape report that we just released from the second half of 2021, it has not stopped. We saw an unprecedented spike and increase in the first half of last year, about 1,100% rise, and that high water mark continues. It's been a relentless surge of uh, activity. And in fact, it's it's concerning because we have this convergence happening now. Um, so yes, we have these unprecedented and, and continued daily volumes of ransomware on a volume level, but now we also have the actual payload itself becoming more sophisticated, uh, more targeted, and more destructive in nature, especially when we talk about um, wiper malware now being combined with ransom techniques. And so you have two sides there, right? You have this, the, 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 the wave and the volume that continues, but you also have the sophistication rising. And if you combine those two together, then that risk is actually higher. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're recording this the day after in the United States, President Biden just signed an executive order on cryptocurrency. And I, I don't know what you think of it, but I see the, the growth in cryptocurrency as certainly an enabler in the ransomware we've seen. I know you've used the, the term advanced persistent crime, that their capabilities are becoming more like nation states, more advanced persistent. And I think part of it's the steady revenue stream. Yeah, absolutely. And revenue streams, right? Because when, when we talk crypto, we're not just talking about one coin or one, uh, you know, one wallet address. That's, that's the thing. There's multiple platforms, multiple uh, ways to to move money, um, which is um, a dream when it comes to cyber criminals, right? Especially when the, when it comes to laundering funds. Of course, this can all be traced back, as we know, but it takes a lot of resource and effort at the same time, too. Sure. I mean, we remember the bad old days 10 or 15 years ago when there were maybe three, two to three main clearing houses that criminals could use to cash out, to monetize what they got in settlements from the people that they had extorted. And now, of course, as you just said, there's so many different cryptocurrencies out there. You know, there are two or three big players, but there's a lot of smaller ones. So I really think that the diversity of that ecosystem is has been a contributor in this being a steady ongoing thing, more steady than, say, botnets, where you may get a lot of money leasing and then law enforcement or technology or providers crack down and yeah. your revenues dry up for a while. And this just seems to be the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. And, um, you know, speed is another, you know, we talk about speed in the threat landscape report with the, the ability to, to move in terms of attacks, but moving funds is another aspect of that. They can move funds with speed when it comes to crypto. You're not, you're not talking about a two or three day wire transfer, right? You're talking about funds that can move very quickly through these uh, coins and platforms. Yeah, and I, I've, I've thought it was interesting that part of this ecosystem now that has sprung up in ransomware crime even includes help desks to talk people through how to get cryptocurrency, how to open an account, how to make a deposit, how to make a transfer. I mean, this has become you know, an extraordinarily mature criminal ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. And I think they're going to continue to to diversify. We've seen that clearly again, it, like you said, it hasn't just been about one or two of the main players. We've seen even um, hijacking techniques. We've we've written some blogs on this malware that's actually looking to steal uh, crypto from other cybercrime organizations. And when we look at that malware, it's not just one or two uh, coins they're looking at or wallet address types they're looking at many and they continue to expand that to their targets too. Sure. Now, I'm sure you're having the same kind of conversations I am with organizations who say, what should I do about ransomware? And of course, we point them at do the basics. You know, you've mm -hmm. got to have strong cybersecurity. You've got to have the offline backups. But a lot of them come back to me and say, what about cyber insurance? Is cyber insurance something that will help? Because, 
you know, they look into this and they say, these people even have professionals who will negotiate a settlement for me. So I don't have to deal with these scary people on the dark web. Uh, you know, if they look into it a little further, they go, yeah, these people are, you know, they're like the professional negotiators you see in movies. So uh, are, are, are you hearing people look to insurance as a part of their solution? I am absolutely, uh, especially at the large enterprise and uh, level of and board discussions. But you got to remember too, Jim, that while this seems very nice uh, on the outside, the idea um, there's uh, you're also opening up some doors with this too. So, like we we talk about the elusive silver bullet a lot of the times, and we always come to the conclusion that there is no silver bullet when it comes to cybersecurity. It's the same thing with insurance. We can't use that uh, and this is the general consensus i think can't rely on that as as a stopgap measure right because the reality is that on this again putting on the hat of the adversary and the cyber criminals um they're they're clever right they're following these policies that are they know um, that they have viable targets on their end as well that that could uh you know um, lead, lead to paydays on their end so it's something that they're looking at and just just by having insurance yes it's it's something good to have in your pocket as a safeguard and a measure, but it shouldn't be the the one thing that you rely on. And at the same time, cyber criminals, I think, are realize that they, there's a safety net there, and and um, you know they're they're actually adjusting their targets at the same time. Yes, it's certainly not a one size fits all cure. And you know, I I tell organizations look at exactly what you're getting in terms of coverage. It's not going to ensure you for the full loss. It's going to ensure you for things that they can directly measure, like the cost of any fines you have to pay to government, the direct cost of replacing equipment. You're not insured against your business loss, your reputational loss, you know, the things that really matter. And then when you're public sector organization, you're you're you may not be a total open book, but your expenses are largely matters of public record. So as you said, criminals in some cases can actually look to see, is this a small jurisdiction that's vulnerable, that's got an insurance policy, and how much did they pay for it? Because they can pre pretty closely figure out what your coverage limit is. They know what to ask for in the settlement. So I've actually said, be careful, you become an attractive nuisance in some cases if you have insurance. Yeah, and the other the other thing here too is, uh, Cyber criminals don't <laughs> don't settle themselves. It's not it's not good enough. They always want more, right? And and um, so just just the fact of having having settlements, doing negotiations with cyber criminals as well, while it may get you past you know out of the corner of the situation that you're in, that could be by the way prevented through all the other measures that we always talk about. Um, you know they <laughs> they're likely going to be coming back for more, right? And, and I think they, 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 they learn this and it's what we've seen in terms of patterns in the past is that, um, you know, if, if you do, if you do rely on one policy or, or, or a payout happens, um, they're going to be looking at other avenues too. And that's something to keep in mind. It's not, again, it's not a, uh, a, a, a good safety measure in, in that regard. Sure. And I think you noted in the in the Fortigard report, either this one or the previous one, the number of organizations that are repeatedly victimized struck three and four times by ransomware. Yeah. I think at some point your insurer is either going to drop you or reduce what they're willing to pay out in the settlement because they say, look, you're doing something wrong and I'm, you know, you're, you're a serial victim. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, it's a track record, right? And um, and again, that that's why going back to the should it be used as as a stopgap measure? No, insurance for cyber insurance, and you know there should be a whole bunch of layers before that measure has to be, uh, you know, that 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 path has to be explored. So yes, it is another layer and something that that you know talking to customers more, we we see that topic coming up. But again, it's it's more on the sort of right hand side of the defense model, if you will, right? When when we're talking about incident response and so forth, um, there's obviously a lot that can be done to uh, with with a relatively low investment upfront of cost, uh, uh, of course, in terms of ROI. Because if you look at the damages and the that's the other thing, if you look at these insurance policies and the targets, these targeted attacks, we're not talking about nominal uh, payment demands from the cyber criminals either. Right. I always talk about ransomware as something that requires a, 
a genuine unified whole of nation response. There's a role for government. And I think in the US with the recent executive order on cryptocurrency, we see something to work on that. There's a role for technology providers. We give people good cybersecurity solutions. There's a role for the insurance industry, but clearly there's a role for the organizations. They've got to be doing the, the basics, the right things too. You know, we don't get in our cars and say, I have auto insurance, I can drive anywhere right. I feel like today. I mean. You know, exactly. it's it certainly is a shared responsibility model for dealing with yeah. ransomware. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Jim. Yeah. So thank you, Derek. Thanks for, as always, for talking with me. Ransomware is a hot topic, and uh, we'll see where we go, given the geopolitical world, uh, you know, what dire turns we see in either the prevalence or the severity of ransomware in uh, the quarter to come. So thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, Jim.